Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Metropole TV, the first Kenyan 24-hour business channel. And it's a pleasure to be here with you today on Friday evening. My name is Ali Khan Sachu. I'm the host of Smart Investor. And uh, you will be with me for the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour. So welcome to the show. Thanks for coming by. It's thoroughly appreciated. Let's start here in Nairobi at the Nairobi Securities Exchange, which is not too far from where I'm sitting now. We had a slew of results as corporates sought to, uh, uh, sought to get inside the deadline of reporting end of the month. Um, and we saw a lot of insurance companies. So let me start with uh, the insurance sector. The first uh, uh, insurance company to release their full year results was Britam. This is Dr. Benson Wairegi. They reported a two billion shilling loss. Um, the loss was blamed on 3.2 billion shillings of, uh, of an unrealized loss in listed equities. Uh, they said uh, they made 0 0.9 billion the year before. This year they lost 3.2 billion. They spoke of lower returns on our property investments due to the depressed uh, market sector and a one-off cost as a result of business restructur restructuring. Last year, we saw heavy investments come into Britain. That was Afric Invest, uh, the Africa PE Fund based out of Tunis. We saw the IFC take a stake. We saw Swiss Re come on the shareholder register. All of them came at a share price of close to 15 shillings. And they're nursing pretty big hits. The share price is below 10. So you're looking at a 35 to 40% loss on those new investors who came on the Britam shareholder register only last year. And I'm sure they'll, they'll have some uh, thoughts about, what's, about these results. So no dividend. We're back below the IPO price or just around there. However, on the positive note, the company spoke about insurance. I think they eked out at about 4.4% gross premium gain year on year. That means they wrote 4.4% more of insurance business. But they're heavy investors in the stock market. I'm sure you're aware they have a big stake in housing finance and in equity. Equity is doing well. Housing finance has had its challenges. They too reported, and they reported a loss. So overall, interesting insurance company in multiple countries. You remember they bought real insurance a few years ago. I think they're in about eight countries. But these results, probably quite disappointing, and especially disappointing for the new shareholders who will be, have to do some explaining to their shareholders as well. We then had Kenya Re report results. They reported that the profit was down 32%, so another declining uh, profit story there. Um, they reduced the dividend by 17% and then spoke about saying, we delivered on our commitments to continue, continue growing the shareholder value, gross written premiums, investment income, shareholder funds and assets, registered growth. However, there was a significant drop in profits for the year ended 31st December 2018 due to high claims posted, that's risk management insurance, uh, that's the actuarial side of insurance measuring, you know, if you're doing life insurance, how long will people live? Everyone's living a lot longer now, this is causing a big problem for life insurance companies in some cases. Um, so, so what they're saying is the actuarial side was, uh, uh, was difficult for them. Um, talked about an impairment of an asset held for sale. I'm not sure what asset that was. And spoke of a significant devaluation of Forex in one of our markets and also a drop in the share of profit from their investment in Zepri. Zepri is also another reinsurance company, Pan-African reinsurance company. The interesting thing about Kenya Re, you know, you, one of the measurements you use for a company is called the price earnings ratio. What that means is, what's the share price? What is the earnings? So let's say, for example, some, uh, a company like Apple trades on a price earnings ratio of about 14. The year's earnings, you're paying 14 times what they earn in a single year. If it's a fast-growing company, you'll have a much higher P-E ratio. As people calculate, this company will grow much more steeply. So some of the companies, something like Netflix, 
P ratio is 75 to 80. Kenya Re, in all the time it's been at the stock market, has never traded, as far as I can remember, on a P above five. What does that mean? It means people are very skeptical about the balance sheet. They're skeptical about the earnings, and obviously with some reason. We also saw Liberty Kenya, another insurance company report, pre-tax profit dropped by 16% in their case. Uh, group earnings after tax, 9% below 2017 on a restated basis. But they said operating businesses showed great resilience under a difficult operating environment characterized by stunted premium growth in Kenya and Tanzania. What they're telling you is that there was not much uh, growth in their underlying core business, which is insurance. That's a trend we've seen across the insurance sector. Of course, we've seen a lot of corporate action coming into the insurance sector. I just told you about Britam, but we've seen others come up and step in, in uh, global insurance companies. And the reason they're coming here is because we're very underinsured when you compare us to the rest of the world, compare us even to South Africa. I think insurance penetration is around 3% in Kenya. South Africa is probably about 11 or 12%. In South Africa, the, the fastest moving insurance product is actually funeral insurance. Um, a lot of folks find that a very big burden and they don't want to be burdened by that cost, so they tend to buy insurance specifically for funerals. In other African countries, it's not that great speaking about death to people, so people don't take that insurance policy out. For some reason in South Africa, uh, this is the most popular fast-moving insurance uh, component. And that's why you've got an 11% insurance penetration rate there, only 3% here. That's why lots of people are thinking, look, it's a no-brainer. There's only one way the penetration has to go up, but we'll see how that develops. Another very interesting company that we reported is Kakuzi. I'm sure if you've ever driven down the Thika Superhighway and driven beyond Thika, you will, have passed their, uh, you will have passed their plantations. Um, and they reported as well, Kakuzi reported a 20% drop in profit. Um, uh, they, 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 earnings per share was down about 18.6%, but they hiked the dividend 28.571%, which is going to get a lot of people excited. Shareholders love to see their dividends increased. They hate to see dividends skipped. A lot of people rely on that income uh, for whatever reason, and therefore folks are very sensitive to uh, the dividend policy and philosophy of any company. And uh, they spoke of saying that, you know, we increased our dividend, we're seeking to in increase it going forward. The reason I touch on Kakuzi, it's a very interesting company. It was originally purely a tea company. But unlike other tea companies, they've diversified. They've gone into avocados, forestry. They're talking about nuts, macadamia, nuts. They're doing uh, poles for, for, for Kenya power, at least they were doing. I think it's a really attractive business. But what was interesting, you know, last year, avocado prices went through the roof. I don't know if you followed that. Globally, there was a huge spike. They hit record highs. And Kakuzi came to the market at that sort of time. And what they're telling us was when they got to the market, there was a huge harvest. They didn't get such good prices from their avocados. And that's what reduced the profit share. I personally think, you know, this avocado business is a millennial story. And the millennials, once they jump on something for whatever reason, particularly in the food space, you'll find, you tend to see a very, very strong demand continue to develop. And avocado is one of those stories. So I think a little bit of oversupply last year. It'll be interesting to see what happens this year. I, for one, think Kakuzi is excellent value, and it's something you can buy if we see a price fall and put it away and, and, and look at it, you know, not too often because I think it's a solid, solid business, well-managed, and it's exploiting new market niches. They also sp spoke about China. You know, we've seen a lot of movement in terms of getting Kenyan uh, commodities, the, you know, food and fruit into the Chinese market. They're quite excited about that and, the, and they're talking about uh, trying to enter that market. Let's now take a little uh, tour around Africa. 
Um, we've spoken about Nairobi and the results season. It's like the horse racing season. You get the results season. These are people all reporting last year's results. Pretty much the deadline is upon us. That's why you got so many today. Moving on to Africa, let's first start with South Africa. South Africa and Nigeria are the biggest economies in sub-Saharan Africa. They make up 50%, those, just those two countries, of the entire sub-Saharan African GDP. And of course, there are 55 countries in the whole of Africa, 40-something in sub-Saharan Africa. But just remember that half of GDP, South Africa, half uh, uh, and, and Nigeria. South Africa came out kept their lending rate unchanged like we did. The central bank governor was speaking about that yesterday. But they lowered the GDP forecast from 1.7% to 1.3%. In part, is because they've had massive load shedding. They call blackouts when the power goes. They call it load shedding. It's, a, I suppose, a less intensive phrase to use. But the point is they've got a massive problem with their electricity. They did not invest under the time of Zuma, and now they are not able um, to fulfill the electricity demand that is there in South Africa. So businesses have to shut down, factories are on go slow, and essentially that's why South Africa is reducing its GDP projection. South Africa has been in this range below 2%. Remember, population growth is over 2%. So what does that mean? It means that on average, people are worse off in South Africa. Same story in Nigeria. Of course, East Africa is a different story. We're growing much faster um, than those two countries. But they're the big elephants in the room, right? That's the point. Um, so the hell rates unchanged, cut GDP forecast. Now, Zimbabwe is an interesting development had this very complex, multi-layered currency system. You had bond notes, RTGS, you had real US dollars. And I called it voodoo economics, basically. It makes no sense. And when, I, when something makes no sense, it's a load of nonsense. So what you've got is a nonsensical uh, currency system in Zimbabwe. They've got to fix it. But what they did was they converted um, uh, these RTGS dollars, basically, um, which they said for a long time are worth one US dollar, and obviously no one believed them. The black market rate was 3.8, and they've, they've tried to make it official. So they converted it, and what they did was they tried to defend a rate of two and a half. And clearly, this was an indefensible rate. It made no sense. That is not the real value. Tendai Bitti said so the real value is somewhere between 8 and 10. And they've, what we've seen is a movement now. They can't hold the line at 2.5. They're now at 3. It's going, it's going in one direction. And the question is, how far does it go? The mistake I think Zimbabwe and its policymakers made is it's a waste of time defending a level which is not correct. You're just throwing money. You're burning it for no good reason, which is what they've been doing. If I was sitting in Muthuli Cube's shoes, I would have let the currency blow out, go way over fair value, and then start supporting it and making some money as well and signaling in that manner. So I think they've got it completely wrong. And I think essentially three to one is still a great sell. If I could, I would. And I would look for it to go to about five or six. It's been unfortunate for Zimbabwe. They just simply haven't managed to get the kind of support they need from the international markets. They still haven't cleared their arrears. So they're still in this holding pattern. And of course, you've now had this problem, uh, with this weather-related problem, which is further going to cause uh, challenges for the country. The worst performing currency in the world is Ghana. That has fallen about 12% this year. The stock market is down about 15% in dollar terms. And this is an interesting story. What happened is Ghana basically had an IMF program, a little bit like the IMF program that we're thinking of, of signing up to. They had this IMF program, and it's expiring. And what's happened is international investors who are holding a lot of Ghana SETI bonds, they were holding uh, other Ghanaian assets have been hitting the eject button. They've been trying to get out as fast as they can. And of course, that has meant the currency has taken the pressure, the stock market has taken the pressure, 
and, in, and Ghana, out of 140 currencies in the world, the worst performing currency you'll find anywhere at all. Now let's just go to the global markets. Of course, it's been an extraordinary week. I mean, uh, I'm going to start with Brexit. As I was waiting to come in here, I was watching the UK House of Parliament. It's become like unputdownable TB. They've had, this was the third vote on Prime Minister Theresa May's Brexit deal. They rejected it again. The pound started to wobble about two days ago. It's wobbling big time. It's right at this key level of 130. It's come here in the month about three times, and people have bought it up at that level. Whether it can hold this time, we're going to discover. But we have tremendous uncertainty. We have a prime minister who has no power anymore. We have a parliament which has power but doesn't know what it wants, so it keeps rejecting every idea. And we've got a country which is practically split down the middle. It's 48, 52, however you care to measure it. So it's a really difficult political situation. It's, and I don't see how they're going to thread this Brexit needle. And in fact, the risk remains that they get kicked out of the EU under the terms of a hard Brexit, which means no deal whatsoever. This would cause, cha this would cause chaos and uncertainty. That's why you've had people stocking up on food, buying tins of beans, thinking that if things go really bad, we're going to have to be feeding ourselves. So, and I, you, know, you wouldn't think the UK would be going through such an environment. Sterling took a beating. Uh, we're testing again, just close to 130. I like this tweet from somebody called Maha Khan Philip, who said it's become Franz Kafka this Brexit. And what they mean is Kafka was typically, um, would write about scenarios where you couldn't emerge, tunnels where you couldn't open doors and you got stuck and it became a nightmare. That's what he, what he liked to write about. And folks think that the same thing is happening in the United Kingdom. And it surely is a nightmare. I saw this in the New Statesman. We are reduced to this. A humiliated, supplicant British Prime Minister sitting alone in a Brussels side room for six hours while the rest of the European Union discusses our fate. What are they talking about? They're talking about the fact that really the UK uh, decided to take this divorce and it's like an old uncle who then decides he doesn't want to move out of the house. He, he doesn't mind the wife staying up there but he's going to stay in your basement. But the thing is, you said you were leaving, and you don't know when you're leaving, and now you don't want to leave, or do you? We don't know. I don't think you know. So it's a really, really tricky situation, and I think Sterling will continue to suffer uh, from this uncertainty. Let's go back to Prime, uh, President Erdogan, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, and uh, he was talking yesterday, and he said, I'm in charge. And that's exactly the problem, President Erdogan. If you weren't in charge, there might be a chance of fixing this problem. President Erdogan said, I'm an economist. He isn't, otherwise he would not keep putting his country in this scenario. I know that sometimes he's irritated, etc., but he does not understand the markets. He thinks he's King Canute. Do you know the story of King Canute? Everyone told him he was the greatest king of all. He could do anything, and he decided he could also stop the sea coming in. And he couldn't. And that's the lesson. There are things that leaders can't do, that they, that they insist on trying to, uh, trying to discover that they can. And this is Erdogan's major problem. So what's happened? Of course, overnight rates went through 1,000%. They've come down now. Back, they've normalized. But the issue for Erdogan is going to be the normalization of interest rates is going to collapse the Turkish lira. And that's a fact. So what everybody is thinking is that the lira next week, we'll keep an eye on it, is going to go to hell in a handbasket, essentially, because without the prop of interest rates, the f money, smart money, smart investors have taken their chips off the table and they said, you know what, we don't want to take a risk with you, President Erdogan. There are other places we can go to. And that has created a big problem. In 1994, I remember, we used to trade Mexico. And what happened was Mexico printed their foreign exchange reserves. 
the currency blew up the next second because everybody realized Mexico was spending too much money trying to defend their currency. The same thing has happened. They've been spending billions trying to prevent the currency depreciating. It's not possible. Every time anyone's tried that, they fail and it costs the country an enormous amount of money. So I think we're in a very, very tricky situation and I'm not sure Erdogan understands the dynamics. He told young voters in Ankara that Turkey had thwarted attacks by the United States and the West on the lira. He might be right because, he, of course, he, he went and bought these big S-400 missile systems from the Russians. They've also delivered that same missile system to Venezuela, and that's why Mr. Trump's very upset. But anyway, they said we'd be, we wouldn't be happy if you bought it from Russia because they're meant to, you, Turkey is a NATO uh, partner. It's meant to be part of the Western uh, system. And here they are going and buying Russian missile systems. And I think this attack on the currency, etc., is in part a reaction to that. Let's turn to Boeing. Boeing faces a lawsuit on the crash that happened, uh, I think, about two weeks ago. This is Jackson Musoni. He's a Rwandan. Um, these are his children who are living in Belgium who are suing Boeing because of this MCAS system. To give you a feeling, it took the CEO of Boeing a week to say something after that crash. Can you believe that? I mean, this is public relations which doesn't exist. It's incredible. And you've seen the price reaction. The share price of Boeing is down 11% since that crash. This is an enormous company, sells the most planes in the world, huge hit. And interestingly, Airbus has gone up 6%. And of course, as we said yesterday, when President Xi visited Emmanuel Macron, he signed a check for $30 billion worth of Airbus planes. That business should have been Boeing's, and they'll be feeling it. And beyond that, there are going to be enormous claims from the airlines who've grounded their fleets, who can't fly their passengers, they're going to come back and say, you know, we've had losses because of you. So Boeing is facing a slew of suits, and it's in a very, very difficult situation. But it also speaks to the power of the rest of the world. Before, we didn't have any power. Today, we boycotted the planes. We didn't want to put our bums on their seats. And within a few, a few days, they had to adjust their behavior. Huawei, of course, very famous in Africa, the biggest telecoms provider, Safaricom, practically a African Union, that story you'll remember that the, you know, the, the, the West accused Huawei of, of basically bugging the entire African Union building in Addis Ababa, which was given free by the Chinese. It's, you will remember that on the 10th of December, when Trump met with Xi Jinping, they had a truce dinner. I still remember the menu. It sounded very tasty, I must admit. But the point was, at that dinner, they, they spent an hour longer than they should have done. They broke out into spontaneous applause. At the same time, they were all clapping, Z and his team and Trump and his team and saying hurrah. They were arresting at the instruction of the Americans, when, uh, uh, the CFO, the daughter of the founder of Huawei, was arrested in Canada. She's still being held there in Canada. It's upset the Chinese a great deal. But let's return to Huawei. They had some really great results. Um, profits rose 25% uh, to $8.8 .8 billion, revenues up 9.5%. They were bullish, they said, uh, about the future. They said they're going to have double-digit growth again uh, this year. And listen to the comments from the rotating chairman, Guo Ping. The U.S. government, he said, has a loser's attitude. They want to smear Huawei because they can't compete with us, he added. The U.S. has abandoned all table manners, he said. This Huawei story is like a proxy war of, between the U.S. And, and, and China, but of course it has national security concerns as well. What the U.S. is saying is that Huawei is leaving back doors open to all their install, installations, which means they can listen to any country, they can plug into any, uh, anybody, and it, it, it's, it's a national security issue now. So let's see how that develops. She's still in, uh, she's still in uh, a Canadian uh, prison. The court case hasn't come up. The U.S. is asking for extradition. In return, I know the Chinese took a few Canadians into prison as well, and they too have not been released either. Now, let me move on to Bitcoin. Last year, I came across a report from Citibank 
had said on a percentage basis, Kenya is the seventh biggest holder of Bitcoin. I was really shocked. I, I, when I looked at that data, I, tr I, I haven't been able to verify it. But according to City at that time, they were saying Kenyans were holding $1.5 billion of Bitcoin. I, I will look and I will relook at that report and check it. But I came across this because whenever, you know the story of Bitcoin, right? 2017, it was at $1,000. Within 12 months, it had gone as high as nearly $20,000. Everywhere I went, when I buy a coffee at Java, the guy would ask me what's happening with Bitcoin. Practically everyone I met on the street was playing in Bitcoin. Unbelievable increase, 20 times, right? This is just unheard of. And in, in price bubbles, this was the biggest price bubble ever. No, there has been no price bubble that has been bigger than this one. And then we collapsed from 20,000, we came all the way down, we went as low as 3,000 and something. We're back at 4,000, it suddenly perked up today, I don't know why, but we're at 4,000, so people are nursing big losses. And this is an interesting quote from the stalwart. The stalwart is somebody I follow, he's in Bloomberg, he's in New York, and he said, Bitcoin is a religion. An altruistic profit. This is Satoshi who invented Bitcoin and he never sold a single coin. We don't know who he is. He's very mysterious. Early disciples, the early people who got in, bought it. These were all the gamers because Bitcoin was used to play games. So these guys would have to buy Bitcoin to play the games and they bought Bitcoin at like 20 cents, 30 cents, 40 cents. Imagine, went all the way to $20,000. Those who rode that wave really made a lot of money. But most people who rode that wave never sold. So they're all sitting on it. And he says, early disciples, schisms, promises of salvation and freedom, sacred texts like the white paper, early Bitcoin talk archives, evangelism, sayings and incantations. So it's quite a story. And I agree with what the stalwart is saying. It's very strange that it's a little bit like gold. People became crypto bugs or they became gold bugs. And whatever you told them, they just did not listen. They believed that it would always go up and that they should always buy it and it would never come down. But we know markets are not like that. There has never been anything like that. Everything that goes up eventually has to also correct. And with Bitcoin, what a brutal correction. Imagine buying it at 20,000 and now it's at four. That would be tough. And uh, it reminded me of a Hunter S. Thompson quote. Hunter S. Thompson was a famous writer who used to like a good time. And he said, life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body, but rather to skid in broadside in a cloud of smoke, thoroughly used up, totally worn out and loudly proclaiming, wow, what a ride. Certainly, Bitcoin from less than a, th it's from $100 20,000, back down to 4,000. Wow, what a ride. Let me finally touch on the commodities markets. Gold, again, which people were bullish, was above $1,300. It's back below $1,300. But more than that, the big bull story was palladium. This kept hitting record highs. And then during this week, it's had its biggest drop since 2010. It is the metal used in auto catalysts to curb emissions. It hit an all-time high on March 21st and it's now been in a slump since then. And it's a very, very big drop. It dropped for the third day and had its biggest drop in nine years. Um, I, th I thank you. We're going to go for a break. Then I'm going to have an inter interview and we're going to speak about data, about uh, the harvest terminal. When I started working many years ago in London, we used to use Bloomberg. And Bloomberg was ubiquitous. And today we're going to speak about what we hope will be the Bloomberg of Africa, the Harvest Terminal. Thank you for watching Metropole TV. I hope you'll come back after the break. Remember, we're on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram. Uh, we'd love your feedback. And I would love your feedback and hear what you want to hear about. So please come and engage with us. And thank you. And we'll come back straight after the break.